Thanks, Mike. All right. Good morning. How is everybody? Pretty good. All right. Um, uh, there's a lady in our church who, um, oh, there's questions. We're going to do questions after this. So uh, track down that link and you can ask a question at any time during the talk. There's a lady who started coming along to church here last year and she'd, um, she shared with me her story. She said, I grew up going to church and I had a lot of questions. She did have a lot of questions. And, uh, and she said, I'd go, to the, I'd go to the pastor at this church with my questions every week. And, uh, and he just... He, it was clear he wasn't really interested in my questions. Uh, she would often um, find him unable to answer her questions. Sometimes he'd just actively discourage her from asking questions. She even said to me one time, she said, I came to him with this question. He goes, I'm going to answer that question in a sermon in two years' time. And she was just like, what the heck is going on? I have real questions here. Why can't someone answer them? And she got the impression that Christianity just did not have answers to those questions. We uh, aren't like that. We really very much do think Jesus has all the answers to life, meaning, purpose, and things like that. And so as a result, we have a thing we like to say at Vine Church. No, there are no dumb questions, only dumb answers. So the risk is for me, not for you. So you can ask anything you like. Uh, but it's also a reason why every year we start a series. We survey our local community and ask them a question to try and understand what their questions are, what their issues are, what their objections are. And so this year we asked them the question, why is it that you don't believe in God? And we received a number of really uh, honest answers that some people, it's the evidence issue for others, religion's too restrictive, and for others, it's the issue of suffering. And we're working through each one of these things, trying to shed some light on the answers the Bible gives for evidence. Is there any evidence? Is religion too restrictive? And what about the issue of suffering next week? Today, we're looking at the topic religion, the reason I don't believe in God is because religion's too restrictive. And for many people in our community, that's the issue, right? That I don't want to, I may, they may believe in God, but they don't believe in a God who tells them how to live their life. Now, back in the 19th century, there was a movement among Christians uh, where a group of Christians came together campaigning against alcohol. And uh, this group became uh, pejoratively known as, does anyone know the name of this group? The, the Wowsers. You ever heard the term Wowser before? Anyway, they became known as Wowsers. And uh, that was a term of contempt. And it's interesting that um, here's one of the postcards making fun of the Wowsers. There's a policeman shining his light on one of the Wowsers who's crossed out everything you're allowed to do on a Sunday. And uh, so notice there, no tobacco, no pubs, no theatres, no surf bathing. And the only thing less were church, prayers, and cold water, right? You can drink cold water on a Sunday, that's it. And uh, notice the policeman saying, and they call this a free country. And that very much gets to the heart of people's attitudes towards uh, Christians today. There was a brilliant photo I discovered this week of a group of uh, wowsers, a, a, a real photo of a group of wowsers from this time. And he, here's the photo. Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours, right? And this, they look like a group of fun ladies, don't they? <laughs> I'm not too sure. I think the sign's kind of going to backfire because it's I think I'd much prefer the bottle of whiskey than kissing one of these ladies, right? Um, but that is the picture of Christians way back then, but it's kind of seeped into our cultural Christianity today. So the modern wowser is, uh, is uh, Ned Flanders, who, you know, confesses every sin, every enjoyable thing he's ever done uh, to Reverend Love. Good, love, joy, whatever his name is. And, um, and I think this is the attitude towards Christians today. It's too restrictive. That Christianity is the enemy of personal freedom. Uh, here's our former Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, saying exactly that. He says the, in an article a number of years ago, he says, the old sort of regime of telling people how to live their lives be you a government or a churchman, who I am, that regime is running out of time. Hear what he's saying? Say, Toby, it's time up. You got to go. Australians want to be free. They want to have independence. They want to have choice. 
So you hear what he's saying? He's saying Christianity is the enemy of personal freedom. Religion's much too restrictive. No one has the right to tell me how to live my life unless I'm hampering someone else's freedom. I need to be true to myself. Uh, everyone should be free to live however they want, so long as they're not hurting anyone else. Uh, no one should criticize anyone else's choices because each one of us has the right to live our lives how we see fit. And it's believed that that view, that Christianity is the enemy of that. Now, is that true? Is a personal relationship with Jesus, is that going to ultimately impede your freedom? Or will actually enhance your freedom? That's what we're talking about today. Before we get there, though, I want to uh, give a definition of freedom. So when we think about freedom, what, how do we define this word? The Oxford English Dictionary defines freedom as the state of being free from constraint or control. So here's an illustration. Take a balloon, and a balloon naturally is quite free to do whatever it wants, but if I connect a string to this balloon, it's not free. There's an external constraint which uh, is hindering it from going wherever it wants. But if I grab some scissors and I chop the, um, the string, it is now free. It is free from constraint and control. And that is an illustration of the secular definition of freedom in our world today. That uh, freedom has come to be defined as the absence of any limitations. There's no strings attached, no constraints. Uh, and this definition has become known as negative freedom. It's freedom from something else. Uh, and it's viewed that religion, because it imposes constraints on the adherent, and Christianity does that, uh, because it imposes constraints in the quest for freedom from constraint, then people have stopped believing in God, or at the very least, they stop believing in a God who imposes laws and commands and puts restrictions on them. Now, so here's the definition. This is what the world's saying. Freedom, it's the most important thing, and by freedom, we mean freedom from constraint, and Christianity is seen as the enemy of that. Question is, does Christianity lead to freedom or not? What I want to do with our time is help you see that if that's your definition of freedom, it doesn't work, and it will damage you. It doesn't work for a number of reasons, and I want to explore those reasons with you today. So three reasons our culture's view of freedom fails, and as I show you why it fails, I'll show you what Jesus has to offer, and then it's up to you to make a decision for yourself. So here's the first misunderstanding our secular culture makes as it comes to this topic of freedom. They misunderstand the nature of life itself. So this idea of freedom's doing whatever you want without constraint doesn't work because it misunderstands how life works and it misunderstands how as humans we thrive in some environments and we break down in others. And the classic illustration of that is of a fish. A fish has two things which make it perfectly free in water, right? So they have gills and they have fins. Fins make it able to propel themselves fast through the water, unlike us clumsy humans with limbs everywhere. Uh, but they're able to propel themselves through water. And they have gills, which get this. I only found this out a couple of years ago. Fish need oxygen to survive. Did you know that? I thought they just, I don't know. Um, I'm like, where do they get this oxygen? Because they don't come up. They turn I mustn't have been paying attention in biology, right? But they turn the water into oxygen with their crazy gills. I mean, flip, that is amazing, right? So they are perfect in water, but imagine you're Freddy the fish, and one day you're all in this water, and you're like, ugh, this water, it's just too constraining. I just feel too constrained by it. And Freddy the fish sees all these people playing beach volleyball, right? And he's like, that's how I want to live. I want to be true to my, I'm a beach volleyballist. And so one day he psychs up his courage. He swims along, shoots out of the water onto the sand, hoping to liberate himself from the constraints imposed upon him by society, only to find himself uh, coming hard up against reality. He can't breathe oxygen 
in the air, uh, and so he slowly withers and dies. Now, what's going on there? Reality imposes itself on his quest for freedom. There is a structure to reality. That reality imposes itself on us. So freedom isn't just doing whatever you want. Freedom is living according to your design. Fish thrive in certain circumstances, and they break down in others, and so do humans. And so true freedom isn't just doing whatever you want. True freedom is honoring your design, honoring the way you were made, honoring your nature, becoming who you were created to be. You're not free just doing whatever you choose. You get the best freedom when you're living according to your design. And so notice for fish, there is a constraint, water. But when is a fish most free? It's when it's happily embracing its constraints and living according to its design in that constraint. When are, when are humans most free? When we understand our nature and our design and the constraints imposed upon us which help us thrive. Now, what is the Bible? In one sense, you could say the Bible is God's instruction manual on how to live a flourishing life. And that's why Jesus Christ says famously, if you hold to my teaching, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, what we need in order to be free is the truth about our nature, the truth about reality. And that's why Jesus says, I've come to teach you. And if you hold to my teaching, you'll know the truth, the structure of reality, and you'll be able to conform your life to reality. And if that's how you live, you truly will be free. And so in this sense, Jesus' teaching is not intended to reduce you, enslave you, but his teaching is designed to set us free to enjoy life as it was created to be enjoyed. Does that make sense? So that's the first misunderstanding our secular world makes as it thinks about, oh, religion's too restrictive. No, 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 no. You don't, re you don't thrive as a human being if you're not living according to reality and those restrictions that make sense of reality. That's the first thing. The second misunderstanding of our secular culture is that it misunderstands the nature of love. So I've been saying that we're free when we live according to the way God's designed us. And that brings us to the question, well, how has God designed us? Just as fish are, are, are designed to live in water, what is a human being designed to live in? And the answer, the Bible says something backed up by contemporary research uh, on human flourishing. The Bible says that humans are made for relationships. So here's what Jesus says. He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And secondly, to love your neighbor as yourself. What's he saying there? He's saying, the purpose of life, the meaning of your life is to have healthy, flourishing relationships, both with the God who made you and with the others he situated you in families and communities around about. The, and, and, uh, and so you see relationship is one of the ways which just shows how the secular definition of freedom just doesn't work. That freedom is just to do whatever I want you can't have a healthy relationship if you're just doing whatever the hell you want. Uh, you know, the idea of freedom's just doing whatever I want, absence of restraints. If you've ever been in uh, a friendship, uh, if you've got a sibling that you're, you're close to, if you've got kids, whatever relationships we find ourselves in, these are the aspects of life when we do feel most free. These relationships we find out, that's what life is about. We're most free in life when we have relationships of mutual love and care. Friendships, families, church community, romantic love. But here's the paradox. The moment you get into a relationship and the deeper and the richer it becomes, the more you have to give up your independence. So last night, I went out with a friend for dinner, and my friend has just a, uh, uh, 
he, uh, he loves subcontinental food. He just loves Indian Sri Lankan food. And so he's like, let's drive out to Toon Gabby for some Sri Lankan, right? And I'm like, I'm sure that we can get Sri Lankan pretty nearby in Surrey Hills, can't we? He's like, nah, Toon Gabby, best Sri Lankan in Australia. We got to go there, right? And I like, I like Sri Lankan food, but I'm like, really? Like, that's a lot of time driving out there, a lot of petrol. Do we? Yeah, but friendships only work to the degree that you give up a measure of your personal freedom for the relationship. And so we drove to Toon Gabby and had uh, some great uh, Sri Lankan food out there. That's how freedom works. If I want to know the freedom of friendship, I've got to give up some freedoms, like um, my time in a car. Or take romantic relationships. As soon as I got married... Gone are the days when I can just decide to go on a surf trip with mates at a whim next weekend. These days, if I'm going to go on a trip, I've got to give my wife notice. I've got to ask her, can I do this? I've got to check in with her uh, because I'm not independent anymore. And we make jokes about this, that when you get married, you lose your independence. Ah, he's on the ball and chain or, you know, whatever. We make jokes. But this is a necessary uh, outcome of entering into a relationship. In the best marriages, the husband and wife are willing to sacrifice their freedom for the good of the other. And they accept the constraints that arrive from having to live with someone else. And so if I don't check in with Liz, hey, I'm thinking about going on a road trip with some friends, does this date work? She might say, hey, that'd be great. Yeah, go for it. Or she might say, actually, that doesn't work. We, I've got dinner with some work friends that night and I really need you to be there. And if I say, well, look, I'm sorry, I've got to be free, free from any external constraint, just got to be true to myself, I'm a surfer, just got to follow my heart, chase my dreams, uh, my relationship's not going to be strong and I'm not going to enjoy the freedom of love. To know the freedom of love, you've got to give up your freedom. A portion of it. You've got to accept constraints. You can't be completely free in the contemporary sense of the word, like a balloon without a string. You can't be complete and at the same time be in a relationship. Does that make sense? Now, that's what you and I were designed for. Relationships of mutual love and care, which, which link us to one another constrain us. They put restrictions on us. Now, what's interesting is, um, and, and that's why the modern secular definition, it just doesn't work. And contemporary researchers are noticing that. So here's um, Jonathan Haidt, who is a brilliant um, writer, not a Christian, a secular Jew. He's a, a evolution, a, 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 I always forget, uh, he's some kind of psychologist. Anyway, written a whole bunch of really helpful books. I think he's at NYU University uh, as a professor there as well. Uh, Get anything he writes, really good stuff. He's kind of a tad on the left of politics, Um, not a Christian, so he he doesn't have a, 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 he's got no vested interest in saying this, but this is his research. A number of years ago, he wrote a book on happiness, the happiness hypothesis, exploring when and how human beings thrive, and this is his conclusion. He says, having strong relationships strengthens the immune system, extends life more than does quitting smoking, speeds recovery from surgery, and reduces the risk of depression and anxiety disorders. So you can smoke like a chimney, but if you've got a good friendship group, you're going to be okay, all right? Uh, that's what he's saying. He says strong, rela- it's the key to life. Jesus is saying it's the meaning of life. And notice where he goes after this. This is not a Christian saying exactly what I'm trying to tell you from the Bible. He says an ideology of extreme personal freedom Get that. That's what our culture's got. An ideology of extreme personal freedom can be dangerous because it encourages people to leave homes, jobs, cities, and marriages in search of personal and professional fulfillment, thereby breaking the relationships that were probably their best hope for such fulfillment. You hear what he's saying? When human beings just live for their own personal freedom, autonomy, and ambition thinking, oh, that's going to lead to my flourishing as a human being, 
They, they chop the ties to their relationships, which he says was their best chance at flourishing at life. Very same thing Jesus is saying. The two greatest commandments, love God, love your neighbor. This is what life's about, relationships. But our secular definition of freedom, no constraints, doesn't understand that. And no wonder our society is becoming fragmented, disconnected, and we're seeing this epidemic of loneliness because we're told from day one, pursue your own individual freedom. Don't let anyone else constrain you. And the result, lo- profound, deep loneliness. There are other reasons for that, but it is interesting. But Jesus comes and says, no, it's when you are It's when you are loving, that's when you're truly living. But love puts constraints on us. So the secular definition misunderstands the nature of love. One final quote. I want to show you this. Uh, This is from um, John Stott, who is arguably the most influential Bible teacher of the 20th century. Uh, Listen to his talks and read his books. Very helpful. But in one book, this is what he says. Very profound. He says, true love places constraints on the lover. For love is essentially self-giving. And this brings us to the startling Christian paradox that true love is freedom to be my true self as God made me and meant me to be. And God made me for loving. But loving is giving. Therefore, in order to be myself, I have to deny myself and give myself In order to be free, I have to serve. He continues, true freedom then is the exact opposite of what many people think. It's not freedom in order to live for myself. That's bondage to my own self-centeredness. Instead, true freedom is freedom from my silly little self in order to love God and others. That's key, isn't it? Modern secular definition just cuts us off from each other. But Jesus, his whole goal is to reconnect us both to God and to one another. So that's the second misunderstanding. Misunderstands not just the nature of life, but the nature of relationships. Not just romantic, but our friendships, everything. The third and final misunderstanding is that the secular definition of freedom, it misunderstands uh, our own hearts. Because our hearts are tricky. Um, And it's not just um, the Bible that says this. This is Alain de Baton, a secular Jew, a popular philosopher and writer. Um, Really enjoy his books. A number of years ago, I read his book, Religion for Atheists. He is an atheist, but he realizes that Christianity and religion has so much to offer. So he's like, well, how do atheists do the things that religion's good at. And he writes this book. And in the book, he picks up on our culture's infatuation with our own personal freedom. He says there's something wrong with it. And this is what he says. He says, a lack of freedom's no longer in most developed societies the problem. Our downfall lies in our inability to make the most of our freedom. We've grown sick from being left to do as we please. Being left alone to ruin our lives as we please is not a liberty worth revering. Now, you hear what he's saying there? He's saying when a human being uh, thinks that they have the freedom and that a good life, a flourishing life, is just doing whatever they want to do, there's actually something profoundly sick about that. It's enslaving. Uh, He's saying, hey, being left to ruin your life, just pursuing your own petty ambitions, that's not freedom at all. And that's, uh, that's actually the problem the Bible picks up on. The message of the Bible is that there is something wrong with us, and the heart of the problem is it comes in the human heart. And so Jesus Christ says this, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. He's putting his finger on a problem, the tricky nature of our hearts. He's saying this is the final problem with the world's definition of freedom from constraint. He's like, when we think we we have the autonomy to live as we choose, that that's freedom. 
it actually creates an enslavement to our own desires. And our desires are what ends up controlling us, and we become ruled by our passions, ruled by our whims, ruled by our feelings. And all of us know the pull and power of our appetites. That our hearts are shifty, and they lie to us, and they sometimes attach to things with too much intensity, which isn't good for us. And we need to be correct. Actually, that's, that's not the way to go. And so, um, you know, I remember Donald Bradman, greatest cricketer who ever lived. I remember hearing him describe his greatest ever innings in which he said, in this innings, I hit every ball exactly where I wanted to hit it all day. Now, that is the mark of a great cricketer, isn't it? Every ball that comes, hit it, hits it exactly where he wants it to go. But imagine a life lived like that where every thought, every word just went exactly where you wanted it to go. None of us are like that. We say things which we regret saying. We do things which we regret doing. None of us live up to our own moral standards, let alone God's moral standards. Why is that? Jesus says it's because we're enslaved to a power called sin. That we have this view of ourselves where we are the rulers of our own life, but that takes us in directions which are both not good for us, which we regret in the long run, but we live with this broken self-rule, this crushing ability to live life not the way we are created to live. Try as we might, we can't live life perfectly. And so when we throw off God thinking, hey, this is the way to freedom, what we end up with is something profoundly broken. That lives that are broken, enslaved, polluted, relationships that keep failing because we're missing God's direction in our life. And that's why Jesus says, hey, very truly, everyone who sins, that is everyone who places themselves at the center of the universe, pursuing their own freedom above anyone else's, where they're not loving the creator who made them and not loving their neighbor, when anyone who sins... They become enslaved to their own selfishness. See, true freedom isn't living however you want. It's living according to your design. It's uh, finding those restrictions that fit us and free us. It's submitting to the truth and living a life of love. Even, often, that means giving up your own freedom for the sake of others. And so the secular definition of freedom, it misunderstands the nature of our heart, which shrinks our lives to our own concerns, our own passions, our desires. We latch on to things, and that actually enslaves us, doesn't free us. Let me give you one final uh, example. Imagine you're sailing to Tahiti with a bunch of people, and you're on this boat, and you set the course, okay, Tahiti's that direction. Tahiti becomes this external reference point which constrains the direction you're going to live in, right? I mean, you could go any direction, 360 directions, right? But you're like, no, that... Ex-. And, and as you sail there, any time you kind of go off track, you've got to reset the course back and orient yourself to the goal of Tahiti. That's where you're aiming for, somewhere beautiful, somewhere amazing, but the destination, the goal, it actually constrains you. It draws you towards it and nowhere else, and you're bound to have to keep coming back to that direction if you want to experience the freedom of a sailing trip to Tahiti. But imagine you're on the boat and someone says, I feel so constrained by this direction. It's so narrow going in that direction. Why don't we all get to decide for ourselves where we want to go? Let not, let's not there be an external reference point. Let's bring the reference point to within the boat, us. Now, if that's the case, where do you end up? Well, you end up anywhere, nowhere. You end up sailing around in circles, uh, adrift, just floating through life. That's not freedom. When we throw off God's authority, 
in our lives, when we throw off the place where his authority is drawing us to, and we make ourselves the own authority, we end up with desires that rule us and shrink us and take us away from going to the glorious destination God's got planned for us. See, when we rule our own lives and follow our own individual freedom, life turns in on yourself. And you know, God's goal for you, he has a goal. His goal is to take you somewhere noble and wonderful and greater than where you could go on your own. And in the craziness of our thinking, we think, oh no, that's narrow, that's restrictive, that's constraining. There's no freedom going to Tahiti. But God's like, no, 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 I love you guys. I made you. True freedom is being constrained to go to a glorious destination. It's to have God take us somewhere noble and good, to love. It's to have God say to us, I made you, and I made you to know me. I made you to know others. That's the purpose of life. And that will bring necessary constraints and restrictions in your life. But that's actually when you're most free. And so uh, I take it there are some of you here for whom these ideas are quite new for you. And you're not sure where you stand with God. And I just want to encourage you to keep dwelling on these things. This is of great importance, what we're discussing. If it's true that there's a God who made you and cares for you, you'd be crazy to leave him as a footnote in your life. And uh, Jesus came to set you free. It's glorious what he's come to. I mean, talk to any Christian. They, they happened a while ago for me. I can't, still can't get over what God offers me. But my guess is you've got lots of questions, and uh, we're going to have a time of... Um, questions in just a moment. You can ask your questions at this uh, website. Uh, We'd love to hear them, and I'd love to have an attempt at answering them. I'm going to pray, and then the band's going to jump up and lead us in prayer, in in song. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you, you have a noble and good and glorious goal for us, and a great destination that you're trying to take us Uh, Two, that you've created us for a purpose, that there is a reality and structure to our lives. So often we we doubt your purpose and we try and rule our lives ourselves without giving you consideration. Please help us to see the wisdom of trusting you and the teaching of Jesus in our lives. And, uh, And would we, as we hold to the teaching of Jesus, experience that great freedom he promises. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.